afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming on this bright, sunny, warm Washington, D.C. day to spend the rest of the afternoon inside with us. But we very much appreciate it. I'm Mike Sprague. I'm the director of the Global Risk and Resilience Program and the rec director of the Polar Institute. So together with our friends at the Walsh School of Foreign Services and the Institute for Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown, we are very happy that you are here to not only listen to a report written just a bit ago by a number of experts, but also to engage in, in this discussion, this continued discussion about the Arctic. Uh, you might ask yourself, yet another report? The answer is yes, yet another report. Uh, the question is what we all do with this. Some of the uh, recommendations and the storylines that you will he uh, hear and see and experience in this report, you have heard before. But there are some additions, there's some qualifiers, there's some refining. And as the Arctic continues to change at a dramatic pace, uh, I think it's absolutely fine to have yet one more report. This is not a stagnant circumpolar north. It's a very dynamic north. And so uh, on one hand, we encourage additional um, studies like the one you'll hear about today from our partners, but also we encourage the continued discussion and the continued effort to address the dynamic issues in the Arctic. So yes, it is another report. And our purpose here at the Wilson Center to encourage these discussions, the writings of these reports, the informing of policy, but also to work with many, many partners and build this big tent that can continue to discuss the Arctic in all of its forms. So. With that, let me just share with you how this is going to work. I'm going to invite my colleague from Georgetown up. Uh, he will give a brief discussion about the report, and then I will invite colleagues on the panel to join me up here. We will talk about that, and I would like for you to think about questions, have reactions to, uh, give us your thoughts about whatever it is that you'd like to discuss with us, and make it a really good dialogue between us. And then we'll have some closing remarks, and I was asked three times if there is a reception following. So I know what's important. Yes, there is a reception following our discussion. So with that, let me uh, bring to the podium, and please welcome to the podium, Dr. Kelly McFarland, the Director of Programs and Research Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University. Kelly. Let me begin by thanking Mike and the team here at the Polar Institute for hosting us today. And also, I'd like to point out as well that uh, not only Mike, but Sherry and Jeremy also were participants in the working groups that we held on this topic um, back uh, last fall. And uh, they've been uh, instrumental in, in what we've done. I'd also like to thank Ambassador Barbara Bodine, who's our director, and Vanessa Lyde, who's our editor for the work that they've done on this report, <coughs> as well as thank uh, Jeremy Mathis again, and Ambassador Mark Brzezinski, who's not here today, but they both played uh, an instrumental role in helping us get this off the ground and, and providing briefings. So the working group that I'm discussing and what I'm talking about today that led to this report was the third in a series of working groups on the new global commons, emerging diplomatic challenges, that uh, is thanks to a generous grant from the Carnegie Corporation of New York under their Bridging the Gap initiative. And the working group in question ran for two evenings and included participants, about 25 to 30 participants from the government, academia, think tanks, NGOs, uh, and other groups. So with that, we'll begin talking about the Arctic. And let me back up here. So the Arctic is drastically changing and there's no turning back. Most of you here are interested in the Arctic or know something about the Arctic. That's not news to you. Just last week, though, the UN Environment Program noted that a three to five degree Celsius rise in Arctic temperatures are now basically locked in. The Arctic's about climate change. It's about what it means now, and it, it's about what it means in the future. It's also about economic opportunities and environmental impacts. And last but certainly not least, it's about geopolitics and security. Nowhere are the effects of climate change and what it means for economics, the environment, and security more pronounced than they are in the Arctic. This is a region of opportunities, promise, but also contradictions and perils. So the report itself centers on three overarching points. The first is that this is a new global commons. Even countries with no direct Arctic claims are now showing an interest in the region. And this, in part, for, from some groups, reflects concerns on the changing climate and changing Arctic climate and how that is going to affect 
the globe in general. For others, though, they see long-term opportunities in resource extraction and or polar shipping routes that may be opening in the future. And second, the Arctic is a multi-issue, multi-level issue set. There's concerns at a local level um, on loss of uh, traditional livelihoods, coastal erosion, and the dual-edge prospect of increased tourism. Governments within the Arctic zone itself face broader challenges of installing infrastructure and governance frameworks for these new realities. And then at the global level, there's issues to deal with regarding rising sea levels and more volatile, volatile weather patterns. And then third, surprise is the new normal. And Jeremy will talk more about this, I'm sure. But from a science perspective, it really is uh, becoming higher and higher to render any high degree of predictability as far as the, the Arctic goes. And on that science aspect, and Jeremy will talk more about this um, when he gets up here, but I want to provide some quick details regarding the Arctic's changing climate uh, to give you a little bit of background. So the Arctic is warming at twice the speed of the rest of the globe. And as I mentioned, the UN Environment Program just came out and said that we're now looking like we're locked into a three to five degree Celsius rise. Man, this thing is really touchy. Okay. <clears throat> the rapidly melting sea ice also creates an Arctic amplification process, which accelerates the cyclical engine of higher temperatures and increased thaws. And an even scarier proposition is that the thawing permafrost may eventually awaken a sleeping giant of greenhouse gases, potentially derailing global climate goals. And it's not just a regional issue either, as many of you know. Water that flooded neighborhoods and countless homes in Houston in the fall of 2017 began as, as Arctic ice, as did the storms and a lot of the flooding uh, that hit the Midwest in the, recent, in, the, in the past week. Likewise, polar vortexes and plunging winter temperatures, contrary to what the president might tweet, and tropical hurricanes arriving with greater force and frequency are all remnants of a warming Arctic. Now, there's a lot of implications due to this. And with those implications, there's opportunities, but there's also a lot of challenges. And that's what we focused on and honed in on in this report. And from a security diplomacy standpoint, foreign policy and diplomacy dimensions of the Arctic are fast becoming as complex as the environmental and climatic shifts in the region. There's an increased presence and pace of activity by Russia and growing interest from China, which raises concerns from the United States and other Arctic nations about their intentions. China, for its part, came out with its own policy white paper on the Arctic in January of 2018, and has pretty much now gone all in on what they now call their polar Silk Road. And just last week, I don't know if uh, most of you caught this or not, but the Washington Post had an article about the Department of Defense's upcoming Arctic strategy that should be coming out in the next couple months, um, and the fact that it's honing in a lot on what China's doing in the Arctic. What's clear, though, is that there's broad and growing interest in the region outside of just your normal players of who you would think about when you think about the Arctic. Now, three things will be of particular importance in the coming years, and these are by no means mutually exclusive. The first is resource extraction. The US Geological Survey estimates that the Arctic <coughs> could contain 1,670 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 90 billion barrels of oil or about 30% of the world's undiscovered natural gas and 13% of its undis undiscovered oil. This for tra transformation will take time though, uh, mostly because of profitability issues and also because of the scant regional infrastructure. Exploration and extraction also raise environmental and safety red flags, including the need for comprehensive plans to address potential oil spills from rigs, tankers, and supply ships, as well as to develop enhanced search and rescue capabilities. There's also a lot of interest because of new sea lanes. New polar routes mean shortened transit, which a lot of trade-focused <coughs> nations like China will be interested in. By one estimate, and the, the map on the, the, the smaller inset map on the bottom right shows this, but the, by one estimate, ships taking the polar route from Shanghai to Hamburg instead of the Indian Ocean route could potentially shave 2,800 nautical miles off their journey. Russia is also interested and attracted by an increasingly navigable Arctic. The Russians have what's called the Northern Sea Route, 
which is a key waterway for Russian domestic shipping and international commerce. The NSR, as it's known, stretches across 3,000 miles in seven time zones. And li they are. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I'm, I literally wasn't touching this thing. It's going to project. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the NSR links the vast resources across the Russian Arctic. The anticipated rise in commercial shipping in the region raises other concerns. Any incident in the region could affect multiple coastlines, and it would take days or even weeks to reach a disabled ship. The United States and other nations are ill-prepared to react to such a, an occurrence. And then the third thing is that this also affects national security and geopolitics. To date, there's been significant cooperation on all sides through the Arctic Council's consensus-based approach, regardless of geopolitical tensions elsewhere in the world. But Russia has increased its, its military activity in the region, and as noted, China is now all in on its Arctic strategy. To date, this has all been undertaken collaboratively and or within international norms. But as tit-for-tat military exercises and Chinese attempts to horn in on airports and scientific dual-use facilities, there's no guaranteeing, guarantee that this jockeying can be contained. While science can't predict what the new Arctic will look like a decade or several decades from now, the broad outlines uh, of these changes suggest the need for more focused and collaborative action by policymakers in concert with locals and the scientific community. So with that in mind, with the backdrop and the, the implications and opportunities and challenges that we talked about in our working groups and came up with, we then came up with a, a, a list of guiding principles and policy recommendations. And the overarching goal is to preserve the Arctic's depoliticized and rel relatively demilitarized status while balancing economic benefits and environmental integrity in concert with the needs and views of the local communities. And with that in mind, the major guidelines that we, that we discussed and talked about in the working group, as a first step, the U.S. government needs to reiterate the critical importance of the Arctic region to U.S. strategic and economic interests. Secondly, in all aspects, whether dealing with resource explo exploitation, infrastructure, or what is, whatever it may be, the action and inaction by states has a profound effect on millions of local indigenous communities and inhabitants. Their needs must be part of every calculation and their voices must be part of each conversation. The new Arctic also provides the opportunity for multi-stakeholder cooperation. And along those lines, and finally, as far as the major guidelines go, the basic architecture does exist. The Arctic Council has been successful to date. Whether the Council can adapt to the new realities remains to be seen, but the United States needs to be a participant in those discussions. And now, these priorities cover a broad range of recommendations that we came up with. And some of them have to do with science issues, some of them have to do with diplomatic and security issues, and the first few deal with the scientific side of things. And the first one is to step up shared research and knowledge to encourage effective Arctic policymaking. And closely onto that one, the second one is to encourage and support creation and collaboration amongst regional scientific actors. Pooled knowledge and coordinated efforts offer exponentially greater benefits for all nations and also help us to understand the global nature of these changes. We also need to build on the Arctic Scientific Ministerial. This type of collaboration enhances the relationship between science and policy, and regular meetings of the group will underpin the implementation of realistic and strategic Arctic policies. Now on more of the security and diplomatic side, we also need to commit diplomatic and intelligence capacities to better understand the interests, priorities, and actions of relevant Arctic stakeholders. There are reasons to discuss Russia's endgame and try to figure out what it is. Likewise, the United States and Arctic partners need to forge a closer relationship with China regarding the region. We also need to build partnerships with allies and adversaries alike, 
both formally and through tac track two dialogues. We should also hold in-depth discussions on the next steps for the Arctic Council. And this was, as those of you that follow the Arctic, we had some in the working group that were very adamant that the Arctic Council was outdated and needed, needed to move forward in a different way. We had some that thought the Arctic Council was in the exact right spot that it needed to be and shouldn't be changed at all. But what was apparent was that we at least need to have a conversation about the Arctic Council moving forward and what role it plays and what it looks like. Another recommendation is to create more of a North American Arctic. While we do have our differences with Canada, there's many instances and in, in, in interests that we share in this region, and it makes sense for the U.S. and Canadian policymakers to collaborate more closely. And then finally, and I'm glad Mike teed this up for me in the beginning when he was talking about another report, but finally, we need to communicate better and more proactively about Arctic issues. Scientists, policymakers, and interested parties alike share the important task of educating the public on all things Arctic. And this is our attempt to do so. Thank you. This is the classic Wilson Center Audible. We'll just change this up a little bit. Uh, instead of all of us sitting up here and PowerPoints going and people trying to see the screen, uh, very kind feedback from many of you in the audience has said, why don't you just call people one at a time up to the podium and then come to the panel. So today what we're going to do is speak one at a time from the podium and then come up to the panel. Uh, our next speaker is a good friend and colleague. Many of you know him, adjunct professor of environmental policy at Georgetown University, Dr. Jeremy Mathis, formerly with uh, NOAA and Senator Murkowski's office and a longtime uh, friend of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Jeremy. Well, I would definitely want to add my thanks to Mike and Sherry and Barbara for inviting me to be part of this. It was a really exciting effort to work with Georgetown to continue to communicate and understand the changes that are happening in the Arctic. And so I'm going to pick up a little bit on what Kelly started with and talk about temperature. Because for the last two decades, we know that the Arctic has been warming up during the summertime. It's been a sort of a summer warming event. Sea ice melt in the summer. There's been excessive loss of snow, ice cover, the sort of narrative that we know. But in the past couple of years, we've witnessed a fairly significant change in that. Arctic wintertime temperatures are now well outside uh, of anything that we would consider normal. And so this graph here is showing you that. This is from the 2018 NOAA Arctic Report Card. And the two figures are October through December of 2017 and January through March of 2018. And the colors are how warm the temperature was above the average. So everywhere where you see the reds and the oranges are places that the temperature was up to five degrees Celsius warmer than we would expect them to be in the wintertime. And so you can see here's Alaska, here's the central sort of Arctic Ocean, the Bering Sea. Uh, these temperatures through these winter months where the sea ice should be growing and thickening and, and really regenerating, regenerating itself is not happening. And because of that, in 2018, we saw a, a big sort of historic event. The ice in the Bering Sea fell off a cliff. This was a story in the Washington Post in May of 2018, where sort of the end of the month of April, all the sea ice was gone in the Bering Sea, and we said, oh my gosh, what's going on? Uh, a colleague at NASA published this figure showing what the Bering Sea looked like on April the 29th of 2013 versus what it looked like on April the 29th of 2018. So you can see the significant difference between the ice cover in one year to the next. And so we said 2018, it's a banner year, it's radical, unprecedented, never seen anything before like this. And then 2019 came along and said, here, hold my beer, I've got one better for you. Um, and so a month earlier this year, right now as we speak, the Bering Sea is again completely devoid of sea ice, even further north than what we observed last year. So this got covered in Bloomberg uh, a couple of weeks ago. It also got covered uh, in Forbes. And so the picture you see down here on the bottom, this is the Bering Strait. So Alaska on this side, Russia on this side, you don't see any ice. So not only is the ice gone in the Bering Sea, the melt has extended all the way up into the Chukchi Sea, and the ice is just completely gone. 
And so we're seeing this acceleration of change that, once again, we, we're sort of running out of adjectives to use. If last year was unprecedented and historic and unbelievable, what does that make this year when it's even more extreme than it was in the past? So I put some personal pictures up here. I know looking at the maps um, don't tell you the whole story. So these are some pictures that I took. So this is standing on the bridge of the Healy on September 1st, 2014. That's standing on the bridge in the Healy on the exact same spot in the ocean on September 1st, 2017. So I'm not an expert on this. So if you take a look at the picture, you see if you can tell a difference between those two pictures, right? So there is clearly something going on. We also saw in 2014, there was still ice for the walruses to haul out on. They need this in order to graze, in order to calve. They can't swim forever. They do need some sort of stable surface to get up on. But now in 2017, the ice is completely gone. It's melted so far back into the basin that it's no longer viable for the walrus to be up there. So they're hauling up on these gravel beaches. They're stampeding and the young walrus are getting killed. And it, it's a major disaster. Kelly also alluded to the polar vortex. And this is another area where we're really starting to understand what's going on a lot better. As Kelly mentioned, the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the, the lower latitudes here in the lower 48. And so what creates the jet stream is that difference in temperatures between the cold air in the north and the more warm air in the south. But as the Arctic warms up twice as fast as the lower 48, that temperature gradient starts to break down and it makes the jet stream start to wobble and behave in unpredictable ways. And so that's what we've been seeing over the past few years is this dip in the jet stream that allows this polar air to come spilling out. And so we see polar vortex, you know, the coldest air in the last two decades. We saw the, the bomb cyclone last week uh, across the Midwest that we can't point to any one weather event in itself and say that's because of Arctic change but we are starting to realize that, that the systems, the weather systems in the Arctic and in the lower latitudes are starting to interact with each other in a more significant way. And these colder winter storm events uh, are certainly going to be not only disruptive, but they're probably gonna get worse in the near future. So because of that, we need to be thinking about this on three different levels. Sort of first and foremost, we need to be thinking about our friends and colleagues who are living uh, up in the Arctic and the challenges that they're dealing with on the local level and figure out the policies and the ideas that we can put forward to help support them and, and maintain healthy, sustainable communities, then we have to step out to the global perspective and think about things like new Arctic shipping routes and new resource exploitation and weather impacts down here in the lower 48 at the regional scale. And then finally, there's the global scale piece of it. Sea level rise is largely occurring because of the melting glaciers in the Arctic, particularly the Greenland ice sheet. So thinking about the global consequences and, and helping policymakers from around the world better understand just how important change in the Arctic is for the entire planet. So we are making some progress. There's some good news in terms of U.S. Arctic policy. Senator Murkowski introduced uh, new Arctic legislation at the end of last year that sort of um, reorganizes the Arctic Research Commission uh, with a little bit of an update. And it also codifies the Arctic Executive Steering Committee that was established under President Obama as a, a congressionally mandated act, that, that the Arctic Executive Steering Committee would be a permanent fixture like some of our other uh, organizational uh, bodies that we have in the U.S. government, which would be great for getting the interagencies working together and sharing priorities and sharing resources when it comes to responding to the Arctic. The really good news that came out of the budget a few months ago was that there was funding for the polar icebreaker for our first heavy icebreaker that we've had. The bad news is it's going to take about 10 years to build one. So I don't know if you've seen the news. Our, our one polar heavy polar icebreaker that we have right now is not doing well. Uh, it had a few challenges on its way back up from Antarctica uh, about a month ago. And the Healy is, is 20 years old at this point. And so when we think about 10 years from now of this, this new icebreaker coming online, certainly the polar star will, will be gone by that point. The Healy will really be you know, reaching that 30 year mark in terms of its age. So we're really not looking at adding a new icebreaker to the fleet. We're basically just sort of maintaining parity with what we have right now, which is really disconcerting given the changes that we see. So we need to continue to encourage that investment in infrastructure in the Arctic. 
but the drivers are kind of muddled, right? This uh, was testimony in January of 2018 uh, from Fatith Baral, who was speaking on behalf of the IEA, uh, and he said with the current context, it would be difficult to believe that there will be substantial amount of oil production coming from the Arctic before 2030. So there's this recognition that the oil is up there and we, we will exploit it at some point, but it's unclear how quickly we're going to go up and do that. So that complicates the urgency for just how much investment we need at this point. The agencies are looking at that, private industry are looking at that, and wondering what the U.S. Arctic policy is going to be. So from my perspective, and, and I've been thinking about this for the last couple of years, change is going to be the new normal. And I think in a lot of ways we have to get out of the habit of making the change the news. So I, I talked to a, a journalist last week and he called and he said, hey, you know, what's going on in the Arctic? We want to do a story about it. I said, man, you won't believe it. It's insane. We're seeing these crazy changes. It's ridiculous. We've never seen anything like that before. And he said, yeah, that's what you said last year. And I said, no, 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 it, it's really different this year. And he said, yeah, that's what you said last year. And, and so we're sort of losing our ability to communicate just how much the environment is changing because we've just run out of adjectives to describe it. So I think we need to start moving our conversation more towards the societal benefit areas and focusing on specific outcomes and specific deliverables. A lot of these were captured in the Arctic Science Ministerial that we did a few years ago, but it's time to pick these back up, work in the interagency space, and think about how we can sort of move the ball forward on areas like disaster preparedness and human health and resilient communities. These are places where we can make sort of visible, tangible progress in order to help and support the communities that live in the Arctic, but also help us better prepare for the opportunities and the challenges as they come along. So these are the guiding principles and the policy recommendations from the report that we wrote that Kelly uh, spoke to a few minutes ago. So we wanted to leave them up here in case you didn't get them all down, but this is what we'll be talking to. Um, and I think now we'll come up and be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks. <coughs> Oh, excuse me. Thank you, Jeremy. I think we'll we'll leave these up and Sherry. This probably good, probably good backdrop for just your your opening comments. Let me introduce um, uh, Sherry Goodman. She's our senior fellow at the Polar Institute and our Environmental Change and Security Program. Many of you know that Sherry served as the former. She's former U.S. Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Environmental Security. Quite active in the security climate space also has done a lot of writing and research on China in the Arctic, so I think it's apropos for what we've talked about already. Sherry? Okay, let me uh, add my thanks to Kelly for bringing the report to a successful conclusion and Ambassador Bodine and the Georgetown team. Um, I know it's much as a labor of love uh, and it adds to the good body of literature here. So uh, building on what's already been said, uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the changed geostrategic position of the Arctic. Um, because to me, that's what's really new. We know the physical changes have been occurring dramatically over the last several years, more dramatic each year. Um, but why... Ha why are we in an era of potentially new geostrategic competition in the region? It's because of climate change. That's indisputable, okay? Because the sea ice is melting, the temperatures are rising, the permafrost is collapsing, um, and uh, on and on. Okay, so now we find ourselves um, in a changed geostrategic position vis-a-vis -vis both uh, friend and foe, adversary and ally in the region. Um, and what does that mean in this era that we characterize as one of great power competition? Uh, well, let's talk for a minute about the other uh, great powers uh, and the others that have interests in the region. Okay, and let's take, let's just, I'm going to just give some top lines uh, on military, economic, and scientific uh, interests and capabilities. And let's start with Russia, uh, which has the longest Arctic coastline, a significant percentage of its GDP, 
uh, derived from the region and a clear Arctic identity uh, over, over, its, over its history. Uh, it has been expanding its military uh, capabilities, its military bases, its ability to operate in the region. It's been flexing its muscles, not only in Ukraine, not only in Crimea, uh, but also vis-a-vis -vis our NATO allies, Norway, and our other allies in the region, um, jamming, uh, buzzing, basically exhibiting aggressive behaviors in airspace electronically and elsewhere. Reported in the open press now on a regular basis. You just have to subscribe to Arctic Today and you can see a new story virtually every day. Um, okay, and um, China, the other, um, well, I'll continue with Russia, then we'll go to China. Okay, economically, as I said, China, uh, Russia continues to derive a significant portion of its GDP and sees opportunities in the climate era to increase um, its economic opportunity, both from uh, access to energy and mineral resources in the region, uh, even as, as Jeremy notes, maybe they won't be accessible in the next five years, but nonetheless, they're open to foreign investment at Yamal and other places to prepare to build that infrastructure to extract those resources. Um, they're also preparing the northern sea route, the route that runs along the Arctic, their Arctic coastline, to be a toll road uh, of significant economic advantage and control uh, as countries from China to Singapore to others will transit that route to move goods from Asia to European markets. Uh, and scientifically, Russia has had a long history of a tradition of scientific research in the region, which it continues, um, which it, we know it's, is used, of course, um, for multiple purposes, and, and they've been continuing their investment um, in that area as well. Now, uh, China. China, which, of course, has no Arctic coastline, uh, but declared in its 2018 first um, released Arctic policy paper that it is a now a near Arctic stakeholder, uh, an Arctic stakeholder and a near Arctic state, uh, and articulated substantial interests in the region. It too is substantially growing its ice capable um, activities, ice capable fleet, doesn't match Russia's 40. Of course, as you heard from Jeremy, we have two. Uh, but the ch but China already has two more more recent capable ice capable vessels icebreakers and ice capable vessels and is on a path to build more um, and clearly sees economic opportunity in the region not only a quest for resources to feed its vast population um, energy uh, and markets in Europe but potentially a quest for global influence as well. Uh, if you look at uh, as some of our colleagues who've presented here before from, from the Center for Naval Analysis where I used to hang my hat, Mark Rosen and his colleague Kara Thuringer who was here have done a very good study on foreign direct investment in the region um, and, and if you look at the, it, the numbers are, are only becoming more so with the percentage of Chinese investment in both Greenland and Iceland and in growing rates uh, particularly as Greenland becomes increasingly independent uh, from Denmark. So uh, economic interests of a variety of types continue, um, are increasing. And then finally, um, China has is, is developed a lot of scientific capability, um, deploying its researchers in Svalbard, in other parts of the Arctic, um, in a way that enhances their ability to understand the cha changing Arctic conditions, uh, but also positions uh, the country to, you to have that as a strategic asset. Again, both countries, as was observed, take a long view. Um, the U.S. has long had uh, both military capability, some economic interests, 
and scientific capability across the Arctic. Uh, our approach has sort of waxed and waned over various years, uh, and it's, it's one that really begs our need to look seriously at our, both our own national interests and the changing geostrategy of the region uh, right now. So it was articulated quite clearly by the former Secretary of Defense when he was uh, in Alaska last year. He said we need to up our game in the Arctic. Um, and the current NORTHCOM Commander General O'Shaughnessy observed that we need to be able to operate in and through the Arctic. Uh, so we appear to be moving from an era that was characterized almost exclusively by partnerships and cooperation. And let me recognize that the near-term risks we face in the region are ones that absolutely will require cooperation because the risks over the coming decade or more really are ones of a search and rescue. Uh, if a vessel runs into trouble or a tourist vessel or a transit vessel, people need to be rescued, or an oil spill. And uh, the Arctic Council and the Arctic Coast Guard Forum have been very adept at, at developing agreements um, to address those risks. Uh, the question is whether we'll have the capability and political will to actually respond to them should they occur. And I think that is still a very open um, and indeed troubling question when you look at the range of risk with the rapid, rapid rate of change. Um, so what, so um, I guess I'd leave you with um, that we have to be as vigilant about the need to recognize that the climate, that climate change is changing the geostrategy of the Arctic and we have to up our game to understand the full scope of risk and opportunity for the U.S. in the region if we're hoping to develop uh, sustainable strategies for the future. Let me thank each of you uh, for your perspectives and Kelly for laying a great groundwork for the report. A lot of what we wanted, I, I think we would like to talk about today is how we can draw lines between the issues of the Arctic to the, very, to the report and how we can use the report to advance many of the issues that were brought up previously. Uh, Jeremy, thank you for talking about the quickening of the Arctic and how, how do we catch up this to actually make, a, make some kind of uh, influence on our policies and, and procedures and our activities and future investments. And Sherry, thanks for putting it sort of in this global context. As we know now, the Arctic is not a bubble. This issue of Arctic exceptionalism is being poked at. Uh, there is lots happening before. Uh, as Sherry noted, uh, you could talk about the Arctic and people would say, well, let's take this issue with Ukraine and Syria and Crimea and put them over here, which is a good thing, and talk about the Arctic, which everyone agreed to do. But I think in all of our conversations, whether here in this town or abroad, these other forces are starting to enter into the Arctic discussion. And so best we'd be vigilant about the ways in which we approach the Arctic as well. So let me ask each of you one question, hopefully short, short questions, short answer, and then I do want to engage all of you in the audience so that this is a give and take. In particular, how we can make this report not just yet another report that's on our bookshelves. How do we actually take parts of this and advance it in our own ways, in our own organizations, in our own presentations and speeches? So I would like to focus on the report, but le let me just start with, with Kelly. Uh, the idea of sinking or leveraging the research, the scientific capacity of the, of the eight nations, but also non-Arctic nations, the science ministerial, uh, the organizations that work on research in the Arctic, that, that's a part of this report. You mentioned it. Give me some ideas about how we could go about us collectively. How do we go about encouraging or even perhaps pushing a little bit on better leveraging the scientific, the research capacities in the Arctic? In particular, I'm thinking we have lots of need for observing networks throughout the Arctic. So is our best way forward to pull together all of those uh, committees, programs that looking at Arctic observing networks and try to frame an effort, maybe not just us, but endorse, encourage an effort that overlaps, leverages all of the scientific community toward a particular goal, a particular issue. Almost breaking it down like Jeremy did here, instead of thinking of all the issues of the Arctic, is the best way to move forward in that particular area to grab a piece, a certain issue, and try to drive 
consensus and then try to drive assets towards that? Or is it to leave it pretty much just to encourage the activity? Well, I that was not a short question. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> no, no. Um, but, but you set it up in a way at the end that allows me to answer that. So oh, That's uh, what I meant to do. Yeah, that. so uh, well done. Um, but uh, no, I think, it's, I, I think it's actually both because as we talk about in the report <coughs> and as Jeremy talked about at the end of, of, of his thing, there's, there's three components to this. There's the local, there's the regional, and then there's the global. And we always have to keep those in mind even if we're focusing on, I think, just doing scientific research or something on the local level we have to also keep the regional aspect mm -hmm. in mind and then the global as well. And if you're looking at the global, you have to think how is this affecting local, uh, local communities, local ecosystems, and you know, how is that issue that's taking part in the local level affecting the global? And I think you can do the, the individual research, but you have to keep the, the, you have to be able to see the forest through the trees when you're doing this kind of stuff because this has, you know, Sherry did a great job of pointing out how this has become a geostrategic issue now where you know five years ago, 10 years ago, especially people would have been, oh, there's the climate's changing in the Arctic, but you know, geostrategy in the Arctic, you know, what is that? You know, so um, I think that's changing today. And I think you know, pushing this forward at, the, at all different levels and then keeping in mind how it affects everything is important. Um, but, uh, you know, but just looking at the report itself, um, you know, and, and Jeremy mentioned the Arctic uh, scientific ministerial as well, you know, keeping things like that going, I think is um, is a good way. And one of the things that we didn't put in the report that was discussed a lot um, was the fact that a lot of times science and policy, and I think I've heard you guys talk about it at events here, science and policy have a hard time talking to each other at times too. So I think what as much as we can to bring those two together is a big issue as well. So that, so that policy makers that aren't scientists know how to speak to some extent scientifically, uh, or at least understand the science, and scientists who have no idea how to speak politically or policy speak can somehow figure out how their science fits into the policy stuff. Yeah, thank you. I know that Brendan Kelly and the search program and others are trying to act like an interpreter yeah. <laughs> between the two communities because one needs the other. Uh, and, and the research community wants to know what, what are the questions the policy community needs. And the policy community is trying to figure out how they can communicate that back to the research community so they can drive that kind of collective agenda. Jeremy, so uh, we have all struggled with when somebody says, why should I care about the Arctic? We, we all have our own lists of those things. It could be one or 20, and that's the problem. It winds up to be that. And so your list of how we might digest the, the Arctic, not just talk about, yes, it's changing yet again, but, but this incremental approach to it's changing, but for this community or this social issue, maybe we have a plan for that. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I know the Arctic Council has working groups. There are a lot of people that work like that. So how do we take these uh, recommendations to look at it that way and maybe drive those a little bit better so that we can help the communities address the needs? Sure, well, I think it brings it down bringing it down to the personal level, and I'll share a personal story. Uh, in 2017, we were sitting off of Nome waiting to pick up somebody that was being helicoptered on, and I got just enough of a cell phone signal to be able to call my parents down in southeast Texas, and when I finally got them on the phone, they had evacuated because they had just gotten 60 inches of rain from Hurricane Harvey. Mm. So the entire, you know, Texas coastline was, was covered in water, all of our, you know, industrial capacity, hundreds of thousands of homes, millions of people to displaced, and I'm standing in Nome, sort of on the gateway to the Arctic Ocean, in a region that's completely changed from what it was 10 years before when, you know, I had been up there. So it's bringing it down to that level where we're getting people to see and understand that changes in the Arctic aren't some faraway thing that don't impact our lives. We need them to understand that climate change in those places and in, in severe environmental transitions in those places are going to have resonating effects around the planet. And whether it's sea level rise, whether it's food insecurity, whether it's national insecurity, all of those things are going to cost us money as a country. They're going to cost us resources. And the quicker we come to that conclusion or, or get a significant amount of people to realize that, the faster we'll be able to move towards implementing some serious policy solutions uh, to, to what we're seeing as our challenges right now. Because, you know, unfortunately, it's still it's too much talk. We're, we're still 
having conversations without any outcomes, having conversations without deliverables. And until we get to a stage where we can move ideas into policy, I think we're going to continue to struggle. And, and the, the secret to that is, is getting you know, people down here in the lower 48 to understand what Arctic change means to them. Yeah, thank you. Just a heads up to Ambassador Bolton, who's in the crowd here, that um, we, we may want to talk about the Central Arctic Ocean uh, effort because there was the concept that went, it went from idea to actually implementation uh, of an agreement, and that might be a really good, um, a good thing for us to tease out a little bit. So just, just a heads up, we may invoke your, your name and your, your expertise. Sherry, uh, we talked about the, ice, the icebreaker, uh, which is really a polar security cutter. No one missed the name change and no one missed the insertion of the word security, and uh, whoever was here in the audience, nobody missed uh, the Commandant of the Coast Guard here several months ago standing here talking about the need for a polar security cutter. Changes the narrative when you say icebreaker to a security cutter. Your expertise with the military, uh, especially with the Navy, uh, comes into, into uh, play here. What do you think of sort of the way in which the issue is framed for the Arctic? If you can... With, with a lot of help, but if you can change the discussion around an icebreaker that has been an idea for decades, and as Jeremy has pointed out, uh, our icebreaker, our uh, uh, Coast Guard has not only cannibalized our other heavy icebreaker, but literally they're buying pieces off of eBay. That's a true statement. So we, we've got an issue here. So how did, yes, there's lots of friends on the Hill who made, who saw the importance of, a, of an icebreaker for the United States needed. How did the change the very semantic of making it a polar ice, polar security cutter, how does that play into a community that can then fund something like this? Because my sense is that just like there may be a fond ops for the Navy come the summertime in Alaska, uh, that the security component, the military side of the United States, might be a driver in this overall narrative about the Arctic as well to come. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the uh, I mean, reframing and, and changing the name is important when we characterize climate change as a threat multiplier, which it is nowhere more true mm. than in the Arctic. It clearly reframes what the focus is. Um, it is about the ice, but it's also about the geostrategic, the era of geostrategic competition we now face in the region um, because of it. Uh, the... Security, the, the military community is looking at how it can have the domain awareness, Arctic domain awareness across all domains, air, sea, space, um, land that, that it needs, and it needs a number of capabilities. Some of those are in security cutters. Some of those are in other, um, uh, you know, take other forms. Uh, there's a human dimension, there's a, obviously a big communications dimension, uh, all the services and the Coast Guard have been updating their Arctic strategies as you well, as you well know, and uh, parts of Congress are very interested, um, very interested in that. What I, w what I would say is what, what um, and I think that's good, I, I think what, what uh, you know, we talk here a lot about that um, the Arctic is no longer an emerging region, right? It's emerged, you know, we owe, the U.S. actually has always been an Arctic nation, even if you didn't always know it from discussions happening in Washington. Um, but clearly, Russia has always known it. Norway, Canada, they've always known their Arctic nations. China now, you know, has its own uh, uh, piece of the action in the Polar Silk Road that it's building. So I... Um, what what concerns me is when is if is two things in particular. One is um, when we don't want to see all the root causes of the change, and clearly climate is a root cause of the change. So we have to recognize that and then realize what are we going to do about it. And then the second is um, the need the need. I think it was observed here to fully integrate um, our science and national security decision-making communities in this enterprise. And I think in some areas they are actually very well lashed up and have been on the path to getting even more so. And, um, you know, science, uh, when supported by um, the Navy and other parts, recognizes what the military's needs are. 
A lot of science is for the pure purpose of discovery as it should be, um, but at the same time with the vast um, range of inquiry and investigation that's underway and the need on a, a more rapid basis to understand the pace, the meaning and the, uh, of Arctic change and how to adapt to it and develop resilient strategies, there is a need uh, better to lash up the policy making and, and the scientific communities. Well, thank you for letting me put you on a spot like that. Um, the, the reason I ask, and I'm going to turn it to the audience, if you have questions, comments, uh, I think we have microphones that will we'll find you. Um, the reason I ask that is because, this, it, to me, the, the, all these reports are of incredible value. We all have them. But how those of us who have trying to communicate the Arctic for so long, for decades, have struggled with this issue of semantics. And it's too big. If you're telling me a new ocean is opening, Mike, which I heard said to me last week, I started a PowerPoint by saying, welcome to your new ocean. And I could see eyes just glaze over, can't comprehend the new ocean opening. Well, it is, but it's too big. It's, there's too much here. And so the idea of how we communicate that in chunks, in pieces, actionable recommendations, not, not just we need to take care of it, but what do we actually do about this? Uh, not alarm bells, but words of caution. So that's why I'm asking about the semantics related to how we discuss it, how we communicate it. Uh, and, and how powerful words are, because I think the issue that the reason, one of the reasons we have a polar security cutter is because it was a highlight of a security component here in the Arctic as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, just a little method behind the madness of, of the questions, and I appreciate that. Uh, let me see if there's anyone in the audience, I think there are several, who would like to ask a question or start, start additional conversation on this thread. Well, look at all the hands go up. That's fantastic. Okay, so Jack, thank you. Uh, maybe we'll just start at the back and work our way forward, and then uh, if anyone on this side, perfect. So I will try to keep track on that, and Dave, I haven't forgot that I might put you on the spot as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you. With all due respect, I think your report is pretty much doomed to fail because you're thinking... Don't sugarcoat it. I mean, come right out and... <laughs> well, your, your thinking isn't broad enough. What I suggest is an Antarctic strategy for the Arctic. All of the geodynamical players in the Arctic, with the exception of China, were also players in what happened to Antarctica in the 1950s. The Antarctica Treaty preserved that whole continent to be, you know, that no, there could be no territorial claims to it that would be recognized. It was to be reserve, res preserved as inviolate as possible, dedicated to scientific research and virtually no extraction of resources. And it's worked. And it became the model for the Outer Space Treaty. Why can't the players in the Arctic attempt to adopt something like the Antarctic strategy to the Arctic. What you need to do as the Arctic changes is do more ecological reserves, more preservation, not more resource extraction. Resource extraction and commerce and the Silk Road, of uh, the Polar Silk Road, all of those activities are absolutely certain to degrade the Arctic, and we all know that. The North American Arctic, the United States version of North American Arctic is to fight climate change by accelerating drilling for oil and gas in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. This makes no sense at all. You, you really need to go much bigger and try to enlist all the other players in a real, a very large reconfiguration of how the Arctic is dealt with, but these little incremental things and pretty words on paper aren't going to do it. So let me just, uh, we'll, we'll come forward, Jack, but let me just do a quick response and see if anybody else wants to respond to this as well. But, um, I, you know, the, the eight Arctic nations, and the, I think believe there's 39 now observers to the Arctic Council, they're engaged in these discussions all the time. The difference, you know, we do both Arctic and Antarctic here at the Polar Institute. To me, the major, the, there's a number of differences. So there is work on, on a central Arctic Ocean Agreement, which I, I may ask Ambassador Bolton to talk about. There's the Arctic Council. There's, there's, there's a number of, of organizations and bodies that are looking at this balance between development and, and conservation. As an Alaskan, I see the change in my own modest five acres in Fairbanks. I'm seeing things melt, thaw, and, and, and change dramatically. However, people live in the Arctic, and so how do you supply for them an economic 
basis for them to continue to live in the Arctic. Unfortunately, a lot of places have one thing, and that's this natural resources. So uh, it's very, very complex. But we'll circle back around to that. And having a treaty in place, I don't, I don't know if countries would go to a treaty, especially if there is resource off their coast, which the rest of the globe would like to buy and to fuel their own economies. So it's complex. Get your point, And maybe we'll circle back around to that as well. Thank you. Uh, Jack Wright, ne next question here. We'll just work our way down yeah, here, and then we'll, we'll come back around. From the Coast Guard. Yeah. Oh, Coast Guard. Sure. Well, they <laughs> our Coast Guard not only gets the microphone, but they also get applause, and that seems <laughs> applicable and very good and appropriate. Thanks for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, I'm interested specifically in how Canada and Russia are leveraging <laughs> Article 234 of the Law of the Sea to exert control over the Northern Sea Route and the Northwest Passage. And as those areas become increasingly ice-free in the coming decades, how credible is that claim going to be? And what impacts will there be for the United States as they no longer are able to exert those restrictions? Sherry, you want to take that one? <laughs> um, I, you know, I actually think we should, we should let um, Ambassador Bolton take a first crack at that since he's worked on those issues, but I'm happy to add to that one. Thank you. Can you stand up and address the audience sure. or take a point? Thank you, Dave. Uh, thanks very much. I'm Dave Bolton. Um, so that is a good question. So Article 234 of the Law of the Sea Convention, for those who don't know, talks about ice-covered areas. And um, has language in it that suggests that uh, coastal states have certain additional authorities with respect to ensuring um, that pollution in ice-covered areas is uh, controlled. So the question is, in a place uh, like the Arctic where there is less and less ice, does our, will our Article 234 still be a valid justification for what uh, Russia and Canada are trying to do with respect to their portions of the Arctic? And the answer is probably uh, no. Um, Art Article 234 requires that an ice-covered area be, that an area be ice-covered for at least most of the year, right? And there are more and more parts of the Arctic that will not be that. That's not the only difference of view, though, with respect to the rights of shipping through both the Northern Sea Route and the Northwest Passage. There are other differences that, or other arguments, not only based on Article 234 that both Russia and Canada are advancing that the U.S. doesn't actually agree with. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. I should note that Ambassador Bolton is also a senior fellow here at the, at the Wilson Center. Yeah, so just on that bill, you know, in the couple of years ago in the, um, at the State Department ISAP International Security Advisory Board report on the Arctic, we addressed uh, the issue with respect to the internal waters argument vis-a-vis -vis Canada and Russia observing that, you know, would be in the U.S. interest to help resolve that with our ally and neighbor Canada so that that's not an outstanding issue when this becomes a, an even more ripe issue with Russia, with more ship traffic, and of course, and in any fun ops, we would that we wouldn't abide by that restriction anyway. Nor would we with Canada. But, um, but we, you know, I, I, um, I think it's good. This is going to be an area where um, our Coast Guard, Navy, and other and other lawyers are going to have to pay increasing attention to the both the physical changes as they. Um, change our, our legal interpretation of what's permitted and then what's required. Yeah. Jack's got the microphone there. Jack, thank you for doing that. Jack Durkee, everyone knows Jack here. No, nothing happens in the Polar Institute without Jack Durkee actually making it happen. So Jack, thank you very much. I would add that we look forward maybe in the coming months to hear about Canada's new Arctic strategy coming out uh, and their incredible whole of government approach to the Arctic strategy. And perhaps that there, there's some, I'm sure we'll hear about that particular issue perhaps in, in the strategy as well. Sir. All right, hey there. Uh, quick question, hope you can answer it. Uh, my question is what exactly will the United States need to change in its Arctic warfare or any other military strategies in order to stay above countries like Russia and China? I can answer that in one question. Well, money. <laughs> <laughs> Investment. So I is it, uh, let me just f do a follow-up. Is it just money or is it uh, a realization by the United States that it too needs perhaps a whole of government approach to the Arctic? That is, yes, money. Uh, but, but in fact, our Arctic strategy, I don't know, hasn't all changed all that much in writing. 
uh, the branches of, of military are all looking at their strategies and their plans. Uh, but that certainly doesn't, you know, impact necessarily FEMA's approach to the Arctic, which, you know, FEMA does not recognize slow-moving uh, disasters of which you aptly showed. So, so is it far more than, I mean, yes, it's a national security issue, but is it far more a whole of government approach and realization that this is an important place? And See, Mike, the that's the problem. You had to complicate it. Okay, right? well, you that's right. one simple answer. Okay. No, we, we have to do your part before we can do my part, but, you know, ultimately the, the conversations that we have have to lead to new resources being devoted to this region, whether it's FEMA or whether it's Coast Guard or whether it's Navy. There has to be a commitment to increased investment if we're going to maintain even coast, close to a semblance of parity with, with Russia uh, and the other countries like China that, that are really seeing this as an opportunity and, and really gearing up to take advantage of it. Yeah, there does not exist a port, an Arctic port in the state of Alaska. Uh, Kelly, are there things related to the, to the report to answer that particular question? As far as um, military strategy in the north, I mean, I, I think it, you know, just to echo what Jeremy said, I mean, it is a resource problem and a resource issue, and you just highlighted it again by saying that there is an important in the state of Alaska. So, I mean, I mean, these are issues that, you know, Russia sees itself as, and it is an Arctic nation. I think, you know, Sherry talked about the the economic might of the of the Russian Arctic. I think something like 30 percent of their GDP comes from the Arctic, um, and there's millions and millions of, of Russian citizens that live in the Arctic. Um, to us, you know, half the people in the United States don't even realize that we are an Arctic nation. Um, so I, I think that alone speaks to the issue of, of then trying to get funding for things like that, and and that's where it really all starts. And um, and again, the you know the Coast Guard is is are the folks that sort of deal with the Arctic, and and um, y you know it is a, a funding issue. And and just to go back again to to briefly go back to a previous question real quick on the on the Antarctic aspect of things. Um, I would just say that um, we do have a recommendation in here to also look at um, sort of past and, and look at relevant past issues and events that can shed light on, on future policies and with the Antarctic Treaty and that kind of stuff in mind. Um, but uh, And there's also a good um, uh, study of fr that CSIS did on past treaties that could be used in the Arctic and to look at that. So I, I, you might want to take a look at that as well. So, Okay, next question. Jack, you're up front. Thank you, I'm trying to keep track. Uh, Peter Humphrey, uh, Intel analyst and a, a former diplomat. Uh, happens all my degrees are in geophysics. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about one thing when we look at this issue. And there's a certain intellectual dishonesty here. And that um, there are some good things that are going to unfold because of the, the changes. And yet, in my collection of 20 or 30 reports from think tanks and government agencies, not a single one of them has looked at, here's the good news. And oh, by the way, we have to prepare for the good news as well. Not one of them mentions that we've been through this four times before. And the last two times, walruses, seals, and polar bears survived just fine. Thank you. I mean, don't we have to, some fraction of us have to be intellectually dishonest that A, these changes are probably inevitable now, and B, there is good news that we should be working on with equal vigor to the disaster that's unfolding? Well, I would push back on that a little bit and say we, we do focus on the opportunity. I, th I think this report points that out, and in every presentation I give, I talk about the opportunities and the challenges. We recognize the new resource extraction, the shipping, the tourism, everything that's going to emerge, but in the shorter term, we have to realize the potential risk of doing those activities without any sort of safety net in the Arctic. So I agree with you, the changes, at least in the near term, are baked in at this point, but commerce is going to always outpace government's ability to respond. And so as we're seeing with the Crystal Serenity going up there and, and taking a thousand passengers into a region where there's no search and rescue, there, there's no capability to respond to a disaster, that's a concern. So before we continue to encourage even more expansive opportunities, I think we have to have a pretty sober conversation about just how at risk we are from what we're already doing in the space. 
and, and frame our, our discussions and our conversations around that risk. And I think the other opportunities that we're seeing are um, ones in innovation, education, and um, clean energy. Um, you know, many of the remote villages, particularly across Alaska and Canada, some of which have been primarily powered with diesel, are moving, you know, away from less dirty sources of energy and into cleaner energy sources now. Um, there's an effort to uh, how no, it is difficult, but to diversify sort of the economy of Alaska, not just to be, you know, an oil economy. Um, and I think there's also innovation opportunities. You see that with data storage across the north. You see it across the Nordics. All the Nordic countries see um, opportunities for sustainable um, economic development for the populations um, that live there. So I think that is um, uh, a piece of the, of, of the good news. Thank you. Jack, can I ask you just to swing to this side and, uh, and have, give the microphone to Joel? I'm trying to figure out who. Joel, you had your hand up right early, right up. Sorry. I'm just trying to go in order here, but we'll, we'll work our way around. Thank you. Jack, do you have a Fitbit because you're getting your steps in? <laughs> thanks, and thanks to the speakers for, uh, for bringing us your wisdom today. This is fantastic. My name is Joel Clement from the Harvard Belfer Center, and I, I, uh, I think, Kelly, you referenced the uh, UN report from last week that three to five degrees is baked in. Um, but as you read further in that report, you see that f it's very likely that much more than that is, is baked in. That's if, if we were to stop all of our missions now, and, and we won't. So, and this gets to your messaging, Mike, a little bit. The, the Arctic is in a crisis mode now, and we're starting to see these changes, and it's alarming. But when you start thinking about those numbers and that type of change, and those are just average temperatures, it's stunning. and frightening what is likely to happen in the Arctic. So I'm imagining an Arctic in crisis frame. Of course, this is pushing back against the good news frame that was mentioned earlier. Uh, is there, taking a piece of this, just the science piece alone, was there any talk among the participants in, in this group about a crisis-based scientific approach, a crisis science, something that can, can tackle these things as they happen very quickly uh, and, and respond quickly, sort of a SWAT team of scientists, mm -hmm. because we're probably going to have to triage what we invest in science, unfortunately, because the public dollars are going down. And I wonder if that came up at all in, in your group. Kelly? Um, I, I don't recall conversations of that nature. I mean, when we, so the, the working group report came out last summer. The working group itself was, was fall of 2017. So, um, you know, a lot of these numbers, as Jeremy said, like there's talk of unprecedented and every year, and things like that, but th we hadn't seen the new IPCC, the follow-up report that came out last year uh, in October. We hadn't seen that yet. We hadn't seen um, the UN Environment Program report. So there wasn't any, you know, talk of of a scientific SWAT team or anything like that uh, to, to approach this as a crisis nature, a as if you would maybe like an Ebola outbreak or something. Um, there wasn't, you know, conversations along those lines. But I'll add to that, oh, excuse me, Jerry. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have it for this, but we did attempt to have the conversation when we did the Arctic Science Ministerial. We got together and said if we were going to prioritize, how would we prioritize and what would they be? And right now, the major science investment in the Arctic is still coming from the National Science Foundation, which by definition doesn't prioritize. They fund the best peer-reviewed science that they receive. And so that's where we run into some trouble about you know, creating a rapid response force is going to take a mission-driven agency to allocate resources to do that because as long as NSF is, is the major driver, it, it's always going to be dictated by the, the best peer-reviewed science. Yeah, that, that's a great, a good question, Joel, and that's, that's a great answer. And just sort of adding to that, and even though the National Science Foundation, I give it credit that it's made one of its top ten priorities, navigating a new Arctic, so it is investing in that. And there are others like Brendan Kelly, as you mentioned, who was trying to look across a broad swath of at least U.S. Arctic research, which includes a lot of global efforts, and enable it to be more mission-driven without forsaking um, the underlying discovery purposes. There's another dimension, and I, I think I see him in the back of the room there, Roger Polwardi from NOAA looking around. Okay, so Roger and I and others um, have been part of our uh, focus in work we've been doing over the last year or so is to better 
couple the human and social science dimensions into the physical science. And this is true not only in the Arctic, but in science in general, with particularly um, in, in, with increasing physical changes, some of it climate, water, whether, to understand the natural resource changes coupled with how humans react, the behavioral piece of it, and the political system dynamics. Um, and that is very important, and it's not, it's not an easy area to fund research in. And in fact, across the board, when there have been cuts in federal science funding, and this is not specific to the Arctic here, but when there have been reductions in federal science funding, often it's on what, what I would call sort of a LIFO basis, last in, first out. And so because that's how institutional capability gets developed, and so if the human dimension social science component and behavioral components are the newer elements uh, coming into various aspects of chemistry, biochemistry, biology, you know, the, the geochemistry, the uh, oceanography, atmospheric science, et cetera, they get pushed out first. And I've seen this directly, and it's, it's disturbing, and I think it's an area that those of us who care about sort of getting good policy solutions in this area also want the science to be integrated across the range of appropriate disciplines so that we can, that's part of the domain awareness to me. Great. Thank you, Jack. We have a question up here. Then I'll work, I'll work my way back in this way. I promise. We have about eh, 15 minutes left or so, so we'll, we'll do our very best. Again, the reception is out outside here, <laughs> so I would encourage you to use that reception to follow up with some of the speakers that we have in dialogue. Please, sir. Hi, Mike. Um, thank you all for uh, sharing your points of view, by the way, this afternoon. But um, it kind of resonated with me, your comments about the difficulty of scientists and policymakers working together. As an NSF-funded scientist for the last 20 years in the high Arctic, I'm wondering, are there any good initiatives that you can think of where larger players in the Arctic have come together in true collaboration? And I'm thinking about data repositories. I'm thinking about um, kind of leveling the line for permits, because every country obviously has its own set of permits, transporting samples, um, any ways that you can see to facilitate this so people who are conducting science um, can have an easier way of doing it and also having access to other works of other scientists globally. Jeremy, do you want to take that from Mr. Sure. Well, I, I think the Arctic Council has made some progress in doing that with the reports they've issued and the recommendations, so it has gotten better. There's a recognition that the things that you're addressing are still problems and, and challenges that we need to think about, but it's one of the recommendations we made, better engagement with international partners and better standardizations of some of the procedures that we're using, whether it's on data sharing or you know, figuring out how to get tissue samples out of, out of a country. But are any of these countries, you know, especially um, China I'm thinking about in particular, but I mean other ones as well, where um, this sense of collaboration is not a sense of competition, but can somehow be brought to a platform where everybody is sitting equally at the table? I will say that's been challenging uh, for the past few years, particularly with China and Russia. They, they have not been particularly open about data sharing uh, the way that, that some of the other countries work in the Arctic have been. But we continue to engage them through organizations like the Arctic Council, and we hope that sooner rather than later we can start working together in a shared capacity rather than a competitive capacity. Okay, thanks. So let me, let me once again put uh, Ambassador Bolton on the spot here, because as many of you know, he, led the, he facilitated the agreement on the Central Arctic Ocean uh, agreement. And so now it's, it's an agreement, it's in force, but uh, now what? What are the next steps on research? How do we cooperate with those nations that actually signed on to the agreement? How do you move it forward? So I think it's kind of teasing out where you were going with it. It might be nice in writing, but are there actual examples of, s of this happening, correct? Yeah. And Dave, I wonder if there's some uh, framework that you might talk about here a little bit. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, so, uh, some of you may know, nine nations plus the European Union signed an agreement to prohibit fishing in the Central Arctic Ocean. Uh, it's not actually in force yet. Uh, all 10 have to ratify. Russia was the first to ratify, interestingly. Um, but one of the things that the agreement does is it requires those 10 countries, uh, nine countries in the EU, to create a joint program of scientific research and monitoring 
in the Central Arctic Ocean relative to um, how the ecosystems are changing and whether that area could support sustainable fisheries someday in the future. And the question, to answer um, your point, Mike, is how is that joint program going to be set up? What is the framework? Um, and there are a number of options that the signatories have in front of them. There are a couple of meetings coming up, one in Russia next month and one in Canada at the end of May to consider just that. But uh, we will need to build this joint program somewhere or another, and we're just not sure how yet. Thank you. So framework, nice words on paper, but, but actions to kind of try to get us there, which might serve as a nice framework for other related efforts. But, you know, at least in my opinion, the ministerial, having those nations around the table agreeing to this ministerial, agreeing to cooperation, agree agreement to sharing data, samples, how you get in and out of countries, there'll still be problems, no doubt. But at least there's something with the Berlin follow-up this last year and now Japan taking on the ministerial in the coming year next year or sometime. Um, at least this is now continued, so the White House ministerial wasn't a one-off. This now continues, so I think hopefully we will all see some breakthrough on this continued effort. Thanks for the question. Uh, next question here I think was in the, yes, right behind you, Dave. Thank you. Hello. <coughs> I'm um, Peter Arbo, uh, professor from uh, University of Tromsø in Norway and currently visiting lecturer at uh, Georgetown. Um, I read your report and I found it's a very good uh, introduction and overview of, um, of uh, these uh, opportunities and challenges we are facing in the Arctic. Um, I, um, uh, I think that uh, it, it clearly emphasizes the importance of, of maintaining Arctic, the Arctic as a peaceful region with uh, close cooperation. Uh, but I found your recommendations then quite vague. It's very much about more research, more knowledge, more information, more communication, and you also mentioned track two diplomacy. But <coughs> you have very little to say about first um, the, 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 the governance system and, <coughs> uh, and also about the Arctic Council. And then I ask not only because I come from uh, the, the town where, where, the, where the Secretary of uh, Arctic Council is located. But I feel uh, you say that we have to hold in-depth discussions on the next steps for the Arctic Council. And don't you have anything more to say about the, the, the governance system and, and how it should be developed in the, in the future? And my second point is uh, about um, what you mentioned, the great power competition. And from a Nordic point of view, of course, we are worried, worried by seeing uh, a more uh, aggressive Russia, a more expansionist uh, China. We see a more parochial and, and unpredictable uh, United States. And, and from our point of view, it's of course, uh, the, the big question is how to, in some way, create new terms between West and Russia. Uh, because the, the current uh, policies are driving Russia and China closer together. And, and we have to, to find new ways to, to improve the relationships to Russia. And you also have nothing to say about that. And I'm a bit uh, disappointed uh, uh, by these two things. Okay, we go on, Joseph. Yeah, so, um, so the first part on the, on the vagueness, I think, um, you know, these were more sort of guiding principles than sort of, we, we didn't write these to be concrete, uber-specific recommendations. Um, and the, a lot of the, what we learned going into it was the fact that, um, and you got to re remember some of the folks in the room were, did Arctic stuff, some were more generalists, some were scientists. There was a mix of different types of people in the room for these working groups. And I think, y you know, the, the fact that a lot of people learned that, well, we don't actually know scientifically what it's going to be like in five years or, or three years even or 10 years. So in many instances, it's hard to make policy recommendations when you don't have the hard science on what it's going to look like or what it's what's going to be happening. So that was part of the problem. And then on the Arctic Council, I, I, I understand your pain on that on that one. Um, but like I said in my comments, part of the reason for what we discussed on the Arctic Council was the fact that we had some people that were adamant that the Arctic Council was anachronistic and was done for and was outdated and had served no viable life in the coming geopolitical landscape of the Arctic. And there was others that were just as adamant that no, it, it's fantastic, it works great. So from that, we couldn't come up with a recommendation. So it was 
there needs to be a discussion about this because obviously there's different camps on the Arctic Council. And we know that the Arctic Council is looking at a new strategic plan. Some of us have uh, for a long time felt as if you know the Arctic Council is being pushed in a number of different ways. Should it take on military issues or not? Well, the answer to that, I think, hands down, is that the Arctic Council on hold does not want to address that. So does there need to be another organization that looks at the ocean, looks at military, <coughs> national security issues? Are, are, is there a need for other related councils because the Arctic is so absolutely diverse and many of us believe that other bodies, other organizations most likely will materialize around one or two particular issues in the near future. But um, thank you for the And, and that's because. what we came up with uh, is one of the recommendations is that we need to find, if it's not going to be the Arctic Council, we need to find a way for mm -hmm. the United States and Russia to have security talks. And we need to have fi find ways. Now it looks more and more likely that the U.S. and China need to have discussions on these kind of things as well. So. Let me make just three quick points on that. Um, I think the Trident Juncture exercise we did with, with the NATO allies was very important. We need to continue that. That's part of upping our game and showing that we're going to operate in the region from a position of strength and protect our allies like Norway. Second, I think uh, we, sh you know, I was in Svalbard a couple of years ago and um, it was observed to me both in Oslo and in Svalbard that the U.S. is among the few countries that doesn't have researchers in Svalbard. Well, it's high time we did so. Um, and uh, thirdly, on the, the um, China-Russia collaboration, yes, that's true in, Lama, in Yamal and in other places, but I also think we shouldn't um, overestimate the extent to which the, the, it's a marriage of convenience between China and Russia in the Arctic and elsewhere. They don't always we, we may think that they're trying to jointly drive a wedge against the West, which of course is true, but it's also true that they don't see the world the same way in every circumstance, and we have to be smart and understand um, where those wedges exist too. Thank you. I'm now going to transition to some closing remarks, and then I know there, is, there are a lot more questions, so we'll take, we'll take it outside um, during the now famous reception. But uh, let, let, me, let me invite to the podium for closing remarks uh, Ambassador Barbara Bodine. She serves as the director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University. We've asked to put her on the spot to give us some reflections and some closing remarks. Uh, so thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you. Uh, and it's, it's an enviable position to be standing here between you and the reception. Um, so I will keep it brief. Um, obviously, I um, want to thank the Wilson Center um, for hosting this and for being such active partners and participants uh, in the working group, um, bringing the expertise that uh, your Polar Institute and you have to the conversation, I think make it made it cr much better uh, and was critically important. Uh, Jeremy, you are always value-added, um, and I always learn so much, most of it depressing, uh, <laughs> when he talks to me about the Arctic. And Sherry, your, your strategic background and your ability to bring those, those issues to the table. And of course, Kelly, who does all the, he does all the work. Um, I'm very pleased with this event and, and the report, uh, even noting uh, some of your, your, your critiques and, and comments. Um, this is, when we started doing our, our working group series and we came up with the title, The New Global Commons, a lot of it looked fairly you know, self-evident. We know what they are. Uh, and then when we decided to, to add the Arctic uh, to the series and realize that even if people can't quite get their heads around the idea of we have a whole new ocean on our hands, uh, we really do have a new global commons, uh, fundamentally different from the Antarctic uh, in, in, in many ways, uh, one that is bringing together so many of the themes um, that operate, the, the issue of climate change, you know, the flooding in Houston or Nebraska, issues of geostrategic competition between us, the Russians, and the Chinese, and I think your comment that let's not over, overstate the Russian-Chinese uh, collaboration. Um, ecology, uh, the question of thinking local as well as thinking geostrategically something that we tend not to do when we think geostrategically is the people on the ground. 
and there are people who live there. Um, and then also, and we talked about this a little bit before the conference, before this event, the need to break down the silos and get the various pieces and parts uh, talking together. This is a scientific challenge, trying to figure out what, uh, what is going on and is what on earth we can do about it, if anything. This is a strategic issue with our major competitors. This is a question of alliance uh, relations and how do we better work with our allies on, on common themes. And then overall, it's a policy <coughs> issue and it's a political will issue. And all of these tend to be looked at in silos. Mm -hmm. um, certainly in the university world, um, <laughs> which is some of the most siloed place outside of Nebraska in the corn. Um, <laughs> the think tank world, and also in the policy world. And I think one of both the challenges and perhaps the opportunity to get to some good news of the new Arctic is that in order to address this new issue with all of its unknowns and its challenges and its opportunities is an opportunity for us to practice learning how to work together, how to get the scientists and the policy makers to find a common language how to look at the geostrategic but not forget the commercial, how to remember the environmental, the very clear and important environmental issues, both the global environmental impact and the very local environmental impact. And if we're, if we're both smart and we're lucky, um, maybe this report, all the other work that's being done uh, in the government and in think tanks in Europe uh, and other places will force us to start looking at how these changes all interrelate and that if we're going to deal with them successfully, we're going to have to talk to each other and get out of our bubbles, get out of our cocoons, uh, get out of our silos. So you asked if, if this report, you know, what, what was going to make it different than other reports. I'm not quite so arrogant to say that this is the report that is finally going to tip uh, the conversation. But the fact that we feel like we have been able with, with Wilson's uh, partnership to maybe add to that conversation and maybe add a little bit more weight to this idea that the Arctic is important, it's not distant, it affects every single one of us, and maybe it's an opportunity to start figuring out how we deal with our 21st, 22nd century uh, problems and challenges. So again, thank you, Wilson. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Sherry, Kelly, Vanessa, for your hard work. And very much thank all of you uh, for your interest in the topic, uh, coming at it from clearly a whole lot of different perspectives and all of you who are listening to us uh, virtually. So thank you very much and I will now get out of the way and not stand between you and the reception. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Thank you to our friends online. We're almost exactly on time, so let's take these discussions out to the infamous reception. Thank you so much.